afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I am Jesse Margolis. I am a circuit court judge in our judicial district, which is comprised of Coos and Curry counties. I am elected to this position. I've been on the bench for a little over 16 years. I've been working in Curry County in law for over 30 years. Did you start when you were two? Yes. <laughs> well, I actually started working in law offices in 1982. So you can do the math. I was a little over two at that point. I wasn't a lawyer then, though. Uh, when I was invited to come today, I contemplated giving two different presentations. One is uh, this slideshow that you see here up on the screen. Another is a presentation that I had given previously to Rotary in 2018 on the Sleepy Lagoon murders, which I'd, I'd like to give that presentation again. I decided to give this presentation because next week I have maybe 120 high school students coming to the courthouse and I'm going to give a presentation like this to them. And so I thought, well, this would be a good practice run. However, as I've been sitting here, I thought, I like democracy. I'm going to leave it up to you all. Let's vote on which presentation you'd like. Some of you might recall the Sleepy Lagoon murder presentation from 2018. Or I can give you this presentation, which is an overview of our courts, what we do, some statistics for uh, our judicial district and our county. <coughs> I vote to do this when I come back again. Yay! Yeah. 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 All right. Excuse me. Well, that's what Can we'll do. Can you do both? Somebody asked. <coughs> I don't have time okay. to do both. Well, <coughs> I'll come back. Happy. Yes. Do you need water? Uh, I think I'll get through it. Thank you. Um, the other presentation started with one of the uh, provisions of the four-way test. This one doesn't, uh, so we'll save that for next time as well. In Oregon, we have a number of different courts, including the circuit court, which is a trial court of general jurisdiction. We have appellate courts and a supreme court that are all part of our unified court system. In addition, there are tribal courts, there are municipal courts, and there are federal courts. The court that I work in is a state court, and when I say a court of general jurisdiction, that means that we hear a wide variety of cases. Everything that can happen at trial level, we hear. We don't do tax law, although some cases have tax issues within them. We don't. There's a separate tax court for the state of Oregon. Uh, in our circuit courts, the cases that we hear include civil cases, which are cases involving civil disputes. It might be a contract. Uh, it could be a dispute over uh, property. Uh, we hear small claims cases and uh, high dollar cases as well, and everything in between, sometimes all in the same day. We hear criminal cases, uh, both misdemeanor and felony cases. We also do violation cases, so minor traffic violations we'll hear, although municipal courts hear more of those than we do. So we could have a traffic violation and a murder case in the same day. Some of you might be surprised to learn that our court does handle murder cases. Uh, some years ago, we had a death penalty case here. It didn't make the local papers, but it did make the organ. Uh, so many people here didn't realize that that was going on. And we have pending cases of that nature right now. I won't talk about them except to say that they do exist and we do deal with some serious criminal cases in our courts. Uh, we also deal with uh, civil commitment cases. Those are cases where somebody is alleged to be mentally ill and a danger to themselves or others. I get a lot of questions about that. How come there are people that seem to need help that aren't getting it? Why aren't they uh, going to the state hospital or getting the help that they need? Courts are limited by the law and what they can do. The standard to have somebody civilly committed is extraordinarily high. And so 
that's why you don't see that. That and our state hospital, where people would often go if they're civilly committed, has capacity limitations, so they can't take as many people as there are who need help. Uh, as I said earlier, we have appellate courts, so the decisions from the state trial courts can be appealed to the Court of Appeals. The decisions from the Court of Appeals can be appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, however, has some discretion in what they hear. Uh, they can decide to take a case from the Court of Appeals or not. Generally, that depends on whether there is an important question of law. If there isn't, then the Supreme Court is unlikely to hear a case. Some cases are automatically uh, sent to the Supreme Court. Death penalty cases are an example of that. And I think I've already talked about that. The Supreme Court has seven justices. Uh, as I said, their review is discretionary, and I've talked about that already as well. In our judicial district, we have six judges. They're all elected in Coos and Curry counties. That's what our judicial district is comprised of. We have two judges who sit regularly in Curry County. I'm one of them. Judge Beeman is the other. We have ordinarily four who sit regularly in Coos County. Uh, years ago, there were two courthouses in Coos County. Now there's one they've consolidated into Coquille. I occasionally fill in in Coquille, and sometimes judges from Coquille come here. And in fact, any of us can sit in any of the state courts in the state. So I filled in in other counties outside of our judicial district as well. Uh, our judges in Coos County include Judge Stone, Judge Bruce, and Judge Combs. Judge Jacot was a judge there as well, but she recently was appointed to the Court of Appeals, and so she's working in Salem now, and there's a vacant position there. Our positions typically are filled by election, but if there's a vacancy midterm, then the vacancy is, can be filled by appointment, the governor appoints. Uh, so that's what's going to happen with Judge Jacot's position. And so we're all waiting to hear who the next judge in our judicial district will be. And that position, of course, would be filled until the next general election, and then that person would run in that election. Uh, this slide shows you sort of a typical uh, number of cases that we might have in a year. There are variations that uh, depend on a lot of things. Of course, we just went through a pandemic that probably had some impact on case filings, and it did cause some slowdowns. Uh, different judicial districts dealt with that in different ways. We really didn't stop working. We did allow for some delays. Sometimes we had people who couldn't make it to court because of that, but we stayed open with distancing. We had to follow some rules that were uh, created in Salem, and so we did that, but we're still able to function pretty well during that time period. Uh, this shows you a breakdown of some of the types of cases that we might have over a given period of time. So that's for 2022, and we still had a pretty high volume of cases uh, for two judges in that time period. And in a typical day, uh, I have court at 8.30 in the morning, another docket at 9, trial starting at 9.30, and then arraignments, some juvenile hearings, emergency hearings at 1.15, which would be at a break during a trial if there's a trial going, and then the next day I start all over again. Many hearings are done sort of on an emergency basis. If somebody's arrested and they're in custody, we have to have a hearing essentially within 48 hours, an arraignment where the person is advised of their rights, the charges are read, often counsel is appointed if they're unable to hire counsel. We deal with those hearings quickly. Restraining order, hearing, stalking orders, emergency, temporary custody orders, all these types of hearings are done on either with no notice or very short notice, and the court is available to do those. We're also available 24-7 for 
uh, search warrants. So we deal with those in the middle of the night uh, often. I talked about civil cases a little bit. I didn't talk about the fact that we also deal with family law. Uh, and I did talk about criminal cases. I'll tell you, this slideshow was geared towards students, so I think most of you know most of the information that's on this slide already. I'm not going to go over it in detail. I just talked a little bit here about uh, what the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony is, and sentencing guidelines. We'll talk about that a little bit. Many people think judges and trial courts have a, a massive amount of discretion in sentencing. That is actually not the case. In felony cases, the sentencing guidelines apply. We're bound to follow those. So an example would be a Class C felony carries a maximum possible sentence of five years in prison and a fine not to exceed $125,000. However, the sentencing guidelines in most instances limit that sentence to 10 days or 30 days if there's space available in the jail. So the, the discretion is not as great as most people assume it is. With misdemeanors, there's more discretion actually. So a class A misdemeanor, a person can get up to 364 days in jail, and the court can impose, in some instances, that much time. In some instances, we're limited to 180 days. The reality, of course, is that with most misdemeanor cases, people don't do either any jail time or very much jail time. Mental health issues in the context of our daily lives is something that I think is people are becoming more and more aware of right now. In the courts, we deal with these issues in a variety of contexts. It's common in criminal cases to uh, have issues related to a person's capacity to or ability to aid and assist their own counsel uh, or in relation to a person's responsibility for their behavior and those issues can be complex and then in addition we have instances where people are alleged to be mentally ill and dangerous to themselves or others and in need of commitment and so we'll have those types of hearings as well on occasion. From my perspective the numbers of both of those types of issues have skyrocketed in the last few years we see just more and more of those issues being raised in court than ever before. There, yes? What kind of information do you have personally prior to a case coming before you? Are you given facts that you're reviewing beforehand, or is it just you're blind when somebody walks in? That's a good question, very good question, and people also assume that I know everything that's going on with law enforcement or with all the civil cases that are going on. I don't. Our volume is high, and so I don't, uh, I don't review a lot of the cases before they appear in court. So if somebody's arrested, I don't have information from the police prior to their court appearance. I don't get information unless I'm the judge who's reviewed a probable cause statement that is required if somebody's in held in custody. So I might have a brief paragraph or two on probable cause for that person, nothing else. I mean, we're going to get to questions at the end, so. Uh, and I might have, for certain types of hearings, I might have memorandum that are filed. In terms of evidence, I only consider the evidence that's on the record where both parties or all parties have an opportunity to see and hear what that evidence is and, and to try to make sure that it's competent evidence, that it's something the court should hear because not all evidence is admissible. So the only fair way to decide cases is to allow the parties to have input on what information the court is using to make decisions. So I don't do any of that outside of court. And it's all on the record. Part of the reason that all of that is on the record is so that if somebody does wishes to an appeal a decision from the trial court, 
there's an adequate record about the evidence that was used. Uh, I typically will set forth my reasoning for decisions on the record. Then the appellate court can review all of that and my reasoning and make a decision uh, about whether there's an error at the trial court level. And that's generally what the Court of Appeals is looking at. The Court of Appeals is typically not deciding the facts of the case. They're deciding whether there was error at the trial court level. And that can be based on a number of things. So recent, there, was a, there are changes in the law sometimes that impact a case that's already been decided. And then that case gets appealed. So when the judge makes that trial court decision, it's the right decision. By the time it gets to the Court of Appeals, that law has been changed and the court and the case gets reversed. The last time I saw that happen was today. It's not abnormal. The Court of Appeals issues opinions every Wednesday. You can find them online. Uh, and they, in Oregon, the Court of Appeals uh, issues a lot of written opinions, more than in many other states. So they explain their reasoning as well, and then those decisions can be appealed to the Supreme Court. Did I answer your question? Yeah, and I had no idea, so thanks. <coughs> Uh, we have grand juries in some instances. A grand jury will decide whether there's probable cause for, uh, to believe that a person's committed a crime, and then they can indict somebody if they make that determination. Uh, grand jury proceedings are secret. The court has very little involvement. I don't participate in that other than swearing in grand jurors and maybe talking to grand jurors a little bit before grand jury. It's really a probable cause finding that allows for that felony charging to occur. There's another way the state can charge a felony without going to a grand jury, and that's by using a charging instrument called an information. If the state elects to do that, then the person who's charged has the right to have a preliminary hearing, which is a hearing to determine probable cause to believe whether a crime was committed and committed by that person. And so that's how grand juries work, basically. How long does a grand jury sit? It varies. Yes. And in our county, many cases are charged by information, not by indictment, but we do have indictments frequently, too. I'd say more cases are charged by information, though. Oregon has statutory and constitutional victims' rights. Victims of crimes have some rights in relation to participation in court, notice of hearings, and uh, so typically at a sentencing proceeding, for instance, uh, a victim has a right to be notified about that, or a plea, uh, they have a right to be notified about that as well. And they have a right to address the court at sentencing. I had that occur this morning at a sentencing proceeding. Search and seizure is an area of law where we see a lot of uh, changes in law over time, both statutory, well, probably not as much statutorily, but more with case law. The Constitution and some statutes uh, regulate how uh, people's privacy and freedom from unreasonable searches is protected, and that comes up in the context of criminal cases where there's been a search or a seizure uh, warrant or a warrantless search, and there is very fact-specific case law that controls how all of that works, and that changes pretty regularly. And so law enforcement officers have to try to keep up with that. When they're in the field, they have to make decisions based upon their understanding of the law and the facts that they're dealing with, and then the court might have to look at the same issues in the context of a warrant request or in a motion to suppress hearing when the defense is trying to keep evidence out, asserting that it was obtained in violation of their client's rights. 
I talked about discretion a little bit already. Uh, again, this slide is geared more towards students than you, but some of it's relevant. Maybe all of it's relevant, I don't know. Uh, I tell high school students that, and this is true for you as well, these courts are your courts. Uh, what we do in the courts, even though many of us don't pay much attention to it or don't understand what's going on in the courthouse, what goes on there impacts all of our daily lives. It impacts businesses, it impacts how we function in society. Uh, it is important work. I hope that the students that come into the courthouse learn enough about what's going on there to understand that this is not only important, but that many of them could end up in careers working in the courts, not just as judges or lawyers, but as administrators or court staff. Hopefully not criminals. Crime doesn't pay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. I think, all, unless any of you want me to talk about this, I think you all know this. This is, again, geared more towards students. Anybody interested in this topic? Anybody planning on going to law school? I will take questions. Uh, can't talk about pending cases. I can't uh, provide opinion on political topics or tell you how I might decide some uh, future issue, but I'm happy to try to answer questions. What's your backlog look like as far as um, things waiting on the docket for you? Well, we have cases probably scheduled out more than a year out. But we have to be able to process cases that need to be processed because of statutory time limitations placed on the courts. So we make room for those cases. Uh, and cases, when we have more than we can do, we'll look at the priority of cases based upon a number of factors and then decide what's going to be heard or not. It's rare that we have to bump a case or not hear a case that's scheduled. We're pretty able to manage our dockets and we, we generally have our trial calendar scheduled pretty well and filled out for the next few months at any given time but with a few days available. Typically we have two or three trials scheduled every day which sounds overwhelming but the reality is is the vast majority of cases settle before trial and so it's common for us to do two or three or four jury trials in a month occasionally there's none some days we're busy for the whole session but an average is probably three or four jury trials we also do bench trials and we do more of those so in the, in the interest of time, um, someone can settle right up to the moment before they walk in. They can settle. Yes. So that just opens up. Yes. There, in criminal cases, there's a statutory provision that is supposed to limit that or limit plea negotiations after a certain point, a date set by the court. Uh, it's difficult to hold parties to that. And even with that in mind, the defendant could still plead guilty or the state could dismiss right up to trial regardless of that provision. So that happens sometimes. Sometimes if the state's not ready, they'll dismiss and refile so they can get around that provision. Civil cases can settle right up until the trial date. Uh, we ask lawyers in civil cases to let us know early so we can reschedule other things. And they're, they j tend to be pretty good about that. We don't have too many cases settling on the courthouse steps, but it does happen. And it is difficult for case management, docketing, when you have too many cases settling late in the game. We, we try to limit that as much as we reasonably can. Yeah.
this might be a loaded question, but you talk about discrepancy in sentencing for, and for not having a lot of discretion, discretion to, to sure. do that. So what's the reason you sometimes see someone like get like five years and somebody get like 45 years? And they look like some of cases. What's the reason Well, and... And talking about the sentencing guidelines, focus on that for a minute. There, there's a grid block that's used that takes a number of things into account. Uh, for instance, a person's criminal history can uh, influence what the guideline sentence for that person is. It might be that one person with the same offense gets some local jail time, another has a presumptive prison term because of their criminal history. Also, there are uh, certain offenses under certain circumstances that lead to long prison sentences, but don't under others. So there's something called a repeat property offender statute. If somebody's convicted of a uh, a crime involving theft, typically, and then a second one on that second offense. If the appropriate precursor crime conviction exists, then they're presumptively going to go to prison. Um, and then sometimes that's stacked up. There are also, there's a, something called Measure 11, which provides for mandatory minimum prison sentences for certain person crimes, and those tend to be long sentences. 75 months or 100 months, and then sometimes those are stacked up as well. So that criminal history and the actual offense that's been committed, those have a big impact on sentencing. And that's one of the reasons why you might see things that look kind of similar, like, well, this person stole something and they got 10 days, and this person stole something and they got a couple of years in prison, why then what's the difference? That would explain it. When you have multiple counts, do you have the discretion of choosing whether the sentence is to serve consecutively or on an average, I think is when you say stacked up. Is that within your discretion? Yes. However, there is law that is applicable to that analysis as well. So there are certain uh, instances where sentences could be consecutive and certain instances where they cannot be. In those instances where a sentence can be consecutive, the trial court would have discretion as to whether they are actually going to be served consecutively or concurrently, or uh, in some instances a judge might decide to impose part of the sentence consecutively and part concurrently. Quick question on uh, well, maybe it's not quick. Um, I presume we're talking about state laws and state laws and you know, you know the, yes. the laws that you have to be subject to what you're talking about. Did you have any comment about how these how Oregon laws relate to national other states' laws in the same kind of I could make some comments on that. Other states, state law does not is not binding on Oregon courts. But in instances where there's no Oregon law on a particular topic, the parties might ask the court to look to other states for examples of how those states have dealt with a similar issue. And so those states can provide some guidance. How do you and uh, Judge Beeman divide up the work load? And you can say something specialty, like one of you does juvenile more, or, you know, uh, uh, states or whatever. Well, I don't want to speak for her. Yeah. I think she has more of a preference for doing uh, juvenile dependency cases than I do. But we both do those. And I probably do a little bit less of that than she does. We, we try to divide the work just basically fairly evenly. Um, and other than that, I, I don't think there's a, really much of a difference in terms of how we, how we do that. Uh, in, in most courts, you have a presiding judge 
who assigns dockets to certain judges. You might have in a much larger judicial district, you might have a judge who's only doing uh, uh, criminal or only doing family law, family law or only doing juvenile law. We do everything, often many different types of cases in the same day. And so we're a little bit different. And we do have a presiding judge, but he doesn't really uh, offer input into how we divide our dockets here. In the beginning, you talked about um, misdemeanor and a felony. But isn't there a felony misdemeanor? No. There is no such thing as that? There is not. There, there, a misdemeanor, by definition, is a crime punishable by up to a year in jail. A felony is a crime that's punishable by more than a year in jail. So. The I'll see that written though, felony misdemeanor. I'm so confused. <laughs> Just the have you watched the news? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's nice. twelve fifty-five. Do you want to okay. go ahead and um, do the drawing here? I, for, I could you, still take a question or two if there are any more. If not, thank you for having me. It's really okay.